Thanks for joining us today at Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. We're lighting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, listen today as Pastor Green shares some biblical truths that will shine upon the true light, Jesus Christ. Um, I shared with you a little bit before we sang about Palm Sunday and how this is Holy Week um, and how the Lord came into Jerusalem on the donkey and all of this week great events took place leading up to um, the crucifixion of Jesus. So this is a very important week for meditation. It's a very important week for acknowledging God, for thinking about what He's done for us and for honoring Him and for praising Him. And I think we need to spend quality time with the Lord, especially this week, and let Him know how grateful and how thankful and how blessed we truly are that He did all of that for us. He did it for me. He did it. I know He did it for the world, but think about this. He did it for me. He took my sins in His body on a cross. And so next Sunday we'll be celebrating Resurrection Sunday when Jesus resurrected from the dead. But between here and there we'll be meditating on the time that he went to the cross and the suffering that he went through. It's called the Passion of the Christ. And so in this week, take time to read the Bible in those particular settings. Like I said, John, I believe it's John 12 and Matthew 21. Both of them have accounts of of Jesus going to the cross. All of them do, but that's one from the uh, both of those are writings from um, the epistles where they're telling the story of where he went into Jerusalem. And it just causes you to be able to relive those moments and to just think about what he went through. And so today I want to talk specifically, though, about Jesus, our cornerstone, and what really that means Um in relation to who we are in Christ, um, Jesus is our cornerstone. The Bible says so. Um, there's a lot of scriptures relating to it. What is a chief cornerstone? A chief cornerstone is a building typically has four corners. Amen. And the buildings back then were built with stones. The chief cornerstone was the first stone that was laid on the ground at one corner of the building, which was then built by adding stones next to it and on top of the chief cornerstone. So that's the definition of a chief cornerstone because that's not terminology that we use a lot these days. So people are like, what does it mean that Jesus is the chief cornerstone? If you can see this in building buildings, there was one main stone that was laid in one corner. And then everything else was built around and on top of it. Now that's how we're built. He is our chief cornerstone. He is our firm foundation he is also and it gets more specifically in it and i'll let me stay in order because i'll get out of order if i start talking how important is the chief cornerstone to the building if the chief cornerstone was laid even slightly angled the whole building ended up at least slightly rotated on its own axis if the chief cornerstone was laid even slightly slanted, the whole building ended up tilted and risk collapse. If that stone was not laid basically perfect, if it was tilted or angled any way incorrectly, everything that was built on it stood a risk of collapsing. So I'd say it was important, don't you? To the building. Who is the stone which has become the chief cornerstone? 
Jesus is the chief cornerstone of our faith. Acts 4.11 says, For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name other than the name of Jesus by which men must be saved. If, you, if what you believe about Jesus is set correctly, this is important. If what we believe about Jesus is set correctly, the rest of the building blocks of our faith will work themselves out and your faith will endure. If, if, you, if what you believe about Jesus, though, is incorrect, Nothing you add to it will correct the error and your faith will risk collapse. This is very important. I want you to see this. Jesus, that chief cornerstone, has to be perfect. He is perfect. But everything built on that stone. We're living stones. You're a living stone. I'm a living stone. We're building our lives on the chief cornerstone. Now, this is important. Whatever we believe about Jesus determines... If we risk collapse or if we risk being built up greater in the Lord. If our belief system is wrong, if we're in error, we're in danger of collapse. So it's important that our faith is based upon the holy word of God. I'm building my house on the rock, on the holy word of God. I'm not going to settle my house down on sinking sand. I don't know if you can see this in, with your spiritual eyes this morning. But everything we believe is so important. To down to what we believe Jesus is okay with and what we believe Jesus is not okay with. Just because we believe it doesn't make it right. You can believe all kind of stuff that is not right. But if you build it on Jesus, if you build it on Jesus, it will stand. But if it's built on a lie, something that's not true, it's like you put the stone there and you twisted it. And it's risking collapse. So you have to be careful who you listen to. And I always say this, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth who will lead you into all truth and will by no means deceive you. There is no one truer in this world to whom we have to turn to than Christ to be our chief cornerstone. And then Jesus said this to every one of us. You, if you believe on me, as the scriptures say, if you truly believe on me, as these scriptures say, then you will receive the Holy Spirit and He will lead you into all truth and your meathead won't try to lead you. Come on. I'm so tired of Christians trying to be led by their three-pound meathead. The carnal mind cannot grasp spirit, spiritual things. They can't even know them. So many people want to take God and pull Him down and put Him into a box of brains. 
and boast of what they know. And all the while, they're blind as Bartimaeus and they cannot see because their faith is not correctly placed in the Christ of the Bible. Christ is my firm foundation. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Come on, he's the anchor of my soul. Amen? This is who he is. Jesus is Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. You say, well, I want Jesus when I want him, but I don't want Jesus all the time. Come on, how many of you today say, I want Jesus all the time? Morning, noon, and night, I want Jesus all the time. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the evening, Jesus at supper time. Be my Jesus. Come on, all the time. Our belief system is so important. How does faith come? How does faith come? By hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. So the word of God has to be preached as it was meant to be preached and not twisted. Some preachers preach the word and alter it. They change it. They misinterpret it. And then people hear it. And they take the people at their word. But God's going to hold us accountable for what we do with his word. I'm going to be accountable and you're going to be accountable for what you do or fail to do with God's word. But I believe this. If you put all your faith in Jesus, he will give you the Holy Spirit, this I know. And when the spirit of truth is come, he... H E, He, the Holy Ghost, God, the Holy Ghost, not Jesus, not the Father, the Holy Ghost, who lives within you, will lead you into all truth. And you will not be deceived. Now, I put all my faith in God's Word in that sentence 32 years ago. I said, I hear one preacher and he says this. I hear another and he says this. I hear a third and he says this. And I don't know what they're preaching, if it's true or if it's a lie. And the Lord said, then you need to study my word with me. You need to know for yourself what this says. So get in it and I'll teach you. So did he do it for me? Did it require anything called studying the Word of God for me? Yes. Absolutely. And it also required that I become a student of the Holy Ghost. You have to be a student in order to be taught. Jesus said the Spirit will teach you. He said, I just don't want nobody to teach me. Then you won't be taught. We need to eat the word in order to grow. If people are not growing, it's because they're not eating the word. If you're not growing spiritually, if you're not growing up in God, it's because you're not partaking of the word of God. It is the bread of life. 
It's the means by which your spirit grows. Desire the sincere milk of the word whereby you may grow. So many people are growing older, but they're not growing in the Lord because they're starving their spirit man to death. Skin and bones in the spirit realm. We need the word daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus said when you pray, incorporate that prayer into your prayers. Give us this day our daily bread. It's important that we get a daily bread. That we partake of the Lord. That we partake of His Word. Some days, we don't have time to hit the, the buffet and get the whole smorgasbord. The grits, the eggs, the bacon, the sausage, the toast, the whatever. Sometimes it's a Pop-Tart headed out the door. Sometimes it's a donut. Sometimes it's a cinnamon roll. Sometimes it's a banana nut bread or whatever. I know that all sounds good this morning. With a cup of coffee. But I mean, if you just have time, grab you a snack on the way out the door. Grab something. Grab that Bible up and say, God, just give me a, a word. I don't have a long time this morning, but I just need something. And I'm telling you, He'll feed you. He'll feed you. The Bible tells us that if, if we sincerely believe that Jesus died on a cross to pay the death penalty due for our sins, that when we die, we will go to heaven. How many of you genuinely, sincerely, with all your heart, believe that Jesus died on a cross for your sins? Well, he said that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, this fact that he bore our sins, my sins, in his body on a cross, that when I die, I'm going to heaven. That's what he said. So we need to build our faith on that. So when we come along and we're positioned properly, our stone, we're living stones, remember? We're built on him. Now your stone is laid upon this stone and it's laid correctly. Hallelujah. That's a very important position of faith. But there's many more positions of faith in life that we come to the knowledge of where we have to come into alignment in order to stay positioned in our faith accurately as we're built upon the stone. Does that make sense? So your faith is going to grow, but if there's ever a point it reaches to where your faith is, and what you believe in is wrong. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The stone's, the stone's twisted just a little there. It's not at a right angle. And it can collapse your faith in that area. Your faith can collapse in that area. So it's important that we be true to our own selves. That we seek for the truth even if it hurts me. Even if it means I have to change the way I thought to the way I think. How many of you, since you got born again, first, first off, first time you ever got born again, until now, you've changed some things that you have believed in and the way you did things and the way you thought things were because you found that this word said differently than what you had believed? Now, those things will keep happening. But remember, if you're born again, if your faith remains in Christ and the cross, you will go to heaven when you die. We're building and we're doing works every day and we're believing things. And we're, the, the wrong word would be evolving. But we're coming into the knowledge of God. Daily, 
We are coming into a greater knowledge and a greater understanding of God and of his ways. The closer you have a walk with God, the more you stay in his word, the more you fellowship with him, the more the Holy Spirit speaks to you and reveals truth to you, you will come into a greater knowledge and understanding of God. But we don't become head heavy. He reveals it to our heart. Knowledge is puffed up, but love edifies. Who am I talking to today? Knowledge is puffed up, but love edifies. And where you will grow when your faith is in Christ, the number one way you're going to grow is in love. Love will grow. Your love for others will grow. Your love for God will grow. But if it's all because look what I know, I know more than you. That's what people did call Gnosticism. It's a Gnostic. Someone who thinks they know more than anybody else. And everybody else knows they don't know squat. Come on. Let somebody else brag on you instead of bragging on yourself. Amen. If your faith is built on this chief cornerstone, it will endure the hardships of life. That'll be an evidence. We say we can't make it through it, but God says, yes, you can because you're built on me. You're not walking in your own strength. I am your strength. People say, hey, you make it through that because the Lord is my strength. He is the one I'm built upon. He's my strength. He is my song. He is my salvation. Even death. If your faith is built on the chief cornerstone, it will endure death. It will endure suffering. It will endure it all. Many people today standing in pulpits, I don't like that word. I don't like pulpits. Sounds like you're pulling them in a pit. <laughs> I like podium. <laughs> Amen. But today many in the pulpits are telling people to believe in Jesus because he'll make you more healthy. He'll make you more wealthy while you're here on earth, and to express their faith by giving their money to their ministry. If you will express your faith by giving me your money, you will be much happier. If you will express your faith by giving me your money, you will be much healthier. A lot of them are promising this. And there is a proper way of giving, and it's biblical. It's with sincere hearts. And we give as unto the Lord, and from the Lord comes our reward. We don't give to men. When you give, don't give to men. When you give, if you're not giving to God, you're giving to the wrong person. And when you give, you need to put it in good soil. You need to make sure that what you give is going into a ministry in which the true gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached or it won't bring a good return. And when you give it, you need to let it go and let it die. And don't say, well, I gave it, I want it back. Or I gave it, I wish I'd have never gave it. Only the seed that falls in the soil and dies is able to bring forth harvest. Hallelujah. I've had to do that times when be obedient. Even the Lord will tell you when you need to give and what you need to give and how you need to give and where you need to give if you'll ask him. The Holy Spirit is your guide. I always say, Lord, what would you have me to give? 
And sometimes it's been more than what I thought he would have me give. But he does test our faith. He does test our faith. You know, God does test your faith. And you can talk faith all day long, but if you can't do what he asks you to do, then you don't have faith in that area. Don't mean you don't have faith in other areas. It just means you haven't grew up in this area of giving. Hey, it took us a little while. We didn't start out with it. I got born again, went to church. They took up the offering. I needed my money more than they did, it appeared to me. They all were driving nice cars, wearing nice suits, nice church, nice building. We were struggling to eat. But that wasn't what it was about. God was wanting me to learn to put Him first. And that's something I wasn't doing. That's something me and my husband were not doing in the financial realm. But God said, if you'll bring to me your tithes and put them in my house where you are fed, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out for you my blessing upon you so much that you can't even contain it all. People wonder how you've obtained, how you've been provided for, how you've been taken care of. How are they doing that? It's because we put God first. We had to step out in faith and start obeying God. I had a salary. My husband had a salary. We both worked jobs. I got born again and began going to church. And the Lord said, I want you to start giving. I believe it was $30 a week. And I gave. And I, did, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. But in the first week, God gave my husband a raise, a dollar an hour the first week. He worked at least 40 hours a week. So what? let's do the math. I gave 30. He got a dollar an hour raise, which was $40 a week the next week. And it continued for the month, which turned into $160 at the end of the month. I sowed 30, and a month later we got 160 more. It don't make math, but it makes faith. It don't make math, but it makes faith. Faith is more powerful than any money you're sitting on right now that says, what? In God I trust. That was put on that money because God does not want us to trust in money. It's an uncertain rich. It can be here today and gone tomorrow. I know one thing. I could be broke tomorrow. But I know this. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, including money, is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Are God's seed begging for bread? Amen? Say he's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things you have need of will be added unto you. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? Do you really have faith in the word of God? Do you really have faith? We talk of faith when we're on the mountain. And talk is easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley of trials and temptations, that's when your faith is really put to the test. 
You get down in a valley. That's when your faith is really put to the test. I remember being broke at times. And I remember going to the mailbox one season of being broke. And there was a lunch bag in my mailbox from Marilyn Hickey. And inside of it was a letter that told the story of the little boy that brought his lunch to Jesus. And Jesus, he gave it to Jesus. I said he gave his whole lunch sack and everything in it to Jesus. Jesus take it. Jesus bless it. Jesus break it. He fed the multitude. He took back up the fragments and the leftovers. I think there was probably, I don't know, if seven or twelve bags of leftovers. Gave it back to the little boy. That's the Jesus we serve. You cannot outgive him. When you give to his work, the little boy was giving to the preaching of the gospel to take care of Jesus and his disciples and the people that were hungry. When you give for that purpose, see, that's laying that stone just right. If you're giving so you can get wealthy, that stone is messed up. That's not laid right. That's not laid right. And many preachers, because they're so greedy, the only reason they preach on money is to get money for themselves. A preacher that don't give should never be allowed to preach. If I don't give, I shouldn't be preaching to tell everybody else to give. But do you know there are preachers out there today that are preaching that don't give anything of their salaries? What a shame. If your faith is built on this lie that giving is forgetting, I'm just going to give so I can get. The truth of the matter is Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you pressed down, shaken together, running over of good measure, men shall give unto your bosom. That is a law of God. It's called the law of reciprocity. What you sow, you'll reap. When you got a need, sow a seed. A farmer knows that. A farmer knows he's going to need corn. He wants corn. What does he do? He sows corn. Yet God's own people cannot see what they need to do to get out of poverty. If your faith is built on this lie, it'll collapse. It'll collapse when the wealth fails, when the health fails to materialize in their lives, then they'll reveal the lie will be revealed and exposed. Many people's figured this out. That they were just after my money. A lot of Christians have brightened up and said, I'm not giving any more to such and such a ministry because they were just taken and they were not preaching the word of God that I might grow in my faith. They didn't have a genuine love for me. They had a love for their selves. They had a love for money. Y'all, they're all out there. There's people that don't love you. There's people that don't care about you. And they may be pretending to, but I pray that we have eyes to see who's who and what's what. Amen. Sow into good soil. Amen. You'll reap. God will, God will bless you. Hallelujah. If the, if the ministry is here for the right reason, for the preaching of the gospel, for the kingdom of God, that the people might know God in a greater capacity, that we might grow, we're, we're part of this building. We're part of the building. 
I'm a part of the building. You're a living stone. I'm a living stone. We're all living stones. Who are the builders? And why did they reject the chief cornerstone? The religious leaders and the teachers. They wanted themselves to be the chief cornerstone of what their hearers believed. They wanted to be the chief cornerstone. And many religious leaders today and many teachers, they want to be what only Jesus is. But we're not. I'm just a stone. You're just a stone. We're all just stones that is built on one chief cornerstone, Jesus. Amen? There is no other name. There is salvation in no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He alone is our chief cornerstone. You got to make sure your faith stays in Christ and the cross at all times. If you fail, if you fall into sin, if you err, you still keep your faith in Christ and the cross, not in your works. Because most likely we will discover that we have believed things in error. We will, as we look in the mirror of this word, we will see things about ourselves that are not right. But God says, don't cast away your confidence. Just because you look in the mirror and you was a mess, you saw things that wasn't right about yourself, all we need to do is grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of God, knowing Him intimately. How do you grow in grace? What is grace? It's the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. Now, Paul, uh, Peter said, grow in grace. How do you grow in the unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor of God? How do I grow? I grow by believing His Word. And in order to know His Word, what do I have to do? Get in His Word and get His Word into me and believe what He said. If He said, give, and I would receive, then when I give, I should expect to receive. We should expect to receive when we give. Some people say, well, I give but I don't expect nothing in return. I believe if I'm obedient to the Lord, He, he blesses obedience. He does. He rewards and He blesses for obedience. He finds that we are trustworthy. I believe God is looking for men and women who he can trust with greater finances to steward the kingdom. Everybody says, we'd like to build a new church. We'd like to really have a nice church with this or that or what or what or what or what or what. Do this outreach, do that outreach. Well, you know what that's going to cost? Money. It takes lots of money to build today, to buy today. Land today is very expensive. Now, we're not trying to build our kingdom on the earth. But any ministry to gather people together and minister to them, you know, it takes a place of gathering. And that's what, when we go back and we look in the Old Testament, you go back to the Old Testament and you look how the tithes were used. They were used to take care of the sanctuary. They were used to help provide for the needs of the ministers who served full time in the work of the ministry. There was lots of people who were going out working, but when they came in, they expected to be ministered to. And God had ministers that he raised up 
that they were to do that. And even Jesus himself had a treasurer. Unfortunately, it wound up being Judas. He wanted to tote the money. Go figure. He was very concerned about the money and wasting money. But he was the very one that betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he was so fake. He could talk a good talk, but in the background he would sell out Jesus for 30 measly pieces of silver. He would betray the Son of God because of his love for money. When the woman brought the alabaster box and she broke it open and poured it on Jesus to prepare him for his burial, Judas was all upset saying that could have been sold and the money could have been brought and brought to us disciples and given to the people to help everybody. And instead she wasted it on Jesus. That man's heart was not right toward God and that man's heart was not right toward money. He had a greed problem. You know, we should pray for ourselves, Lord. If there's one greedy grain in my body, get that greed out of me now. Don't let me be greedy. Help me to give when you say give. You know, give when God leads you to give where he gives you to leads you to give. Amen. Pray for yourselves to be a good steward of time and money. Because they're two very important commodities. How we steward our time, how we steward our money, very important to say what's important to us. Amen? Nobody else died for your sins but Jesus. Nobody died for our sins but Jesus. All these other religions... The people are taught you must die for your faith. So that's why they go crashing planes into towers. They feel that immediately awards them the right to heaven. Because they died. Our faith says our King and Savior and God died for us. Our religion but our faith gets accused of being the most unloving faith there is. But that's totally backwards. Our God loves so much that he sent his son to die. Greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friends. It's the devil. He wants people to make... He wants to make people believe a lie. Because if they know the truth, they get set free from the lies. Amen? Why doesn't Satan point to a dog or a cat and tell people you can be saved by believing in that? Because people would laugh at him. The devil's not that dumb. So who does Satan point to and tell people to believe to be saved? The people who were close to Jesus during his time on earth, including his mother and lead disciple. Believe on Jesus. The devil wants to deceive people that you can believe whatever you want to believe and you'll be saved. But that's not biblical. Jesus is our chief cornerstone. I want to share with you some scriptures this morning. There's quite a few Bible verses. I'm just going to read a few that really are powerful. 
Ephesians 2.20 says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Confirmation, Jesus Christ is that chief cornerstone. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Two scriptures. No other foundation. The song we sang, Christ is my firm foundation. There's no other foundation. Psalms 118, 22 and 23 says, He's the stone which the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. He was the stone those religious leaders and false teachers rejected him. But now he's become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Isaiah 28 verses 16 and 17 says, Therefore thus says the Lord God. Who's speaking? The Lord God. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whosoever believes will not act hastily. Also, I will make justice the measuring line, and righteousness will be the plummet. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow that hiding place. Wow, that's powerful. First Peter 2, 4 says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, was he and precious. He was chosen by God and precious but rejected of men. Isaiah prophesied of him in 8.14. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The only way Jesus becomes a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense is when people are disobedient to him. Then he becomes an offense or he becomes a reason for your stumbling. You know, we can stumble over a stone. So he's called a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to the disobedient. So that positions him to be a different role in our life than a firm foundation for those who hear and believe and obey. He's our firm foundation. But to those who hear and refuse to obey, he has become your stone of stumbling and your rock of offense. It's what the Bible says. It's not what I say. Is what God says. This is thus saith the Lord. He became the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense to both the houses of Israel. And it became a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He became a trap and a snare. Paul the Apostle said, according to the grace of God which was given me, 
as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation. Who is the foundation? Jesus. What did Paul say? As a wise master builder, I have laid for you the foundation. He was saying, I have taught you that Jesus Christ is the firm foundation and there's no other. So he said, now I've laid the foundation for you. And others build on it. And you can build on it. I can build on it. We can build on it. But let each one of us take heed. Be careful and pay attention how and what you build on this. Whatever's coming out of your mouth, whatever you're teaching, it's either truth or it's a lie. And if you build on this foundation, make sure what you're teaching is truly the Word of God. Because not only will you be stumbled, but everybody who listens to you will be stumbled. If I preach wrong and people believe what I preach, then I become a stumbling to them too. And then I'm leading people away from God instead of to God. I'm leading people to trust in something that's not trustworthy rather than trusting in Christ. And I'm going to be held accountable for it before God just as you will. That's why he said, let there be few teachers among you for we shall stand in a higher judgment with God. We're going to be judged not only on what we believed, but we're going to be judged on what we taught. That's why when you get ready to teach and you got the disobedient and you got the people that get mad at you and turn their back on you and when they get home they talk evil all about you because they didn't like what you said. And people reject you. And people stop coming. Because they didn't, you didn't offer a feather that day to tickle their ears. You spoke the word and it cut. And then Jesus says, oh, did they reject you? They rejected me too. If you're going to be my servant, if they rejected you, they'll, if they rejected me, they'll reject you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. He said, are you any better than your master? It's almost like I hear him say, suck it up, buttercup. It's almost like I hear him say that, but this is not always funny. Because it can be your family. It can be your friends. It can be the people closest to you. Because those rejected Jesus too. Jesus went to his own hometown. And he could do no great works there. Why? They rejected him. All he did was came and told them the truth. That's all he did was tell them the truth. And they rejected him. They wanted him gone. They said, we want you out of our lives. Be gone. And Jesus must have walked away. And Jesus must have shed some tears that day. But when you get ready to follow Jesus, you better have some pretty thick skin. Because you never know who's going to walk away from you. You never know if you're not going to have to walk in those pearly gates by yourself. But if He is your firm foundation, He'll carry you if He has to. Amen? One thing you can know when you walk with the Lord, you'll never walk alone. Amen? 
You'll never walk alone. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 17, and I'm going to close it with this. If anyone builds on this foundation, how many builders we got in the house? How many of you are working for the kingdom of God? How many of you are trying to build up God's kingdom? How many of you want to build God's kingdom? How many of us are working and serving the Lord while we're here in this earth? I am. I'm doing the best I know to do. Amen. I'm, I'm a builder. I'm probably, I'm not a master builder. I'd love to be a master builder, but I learn from master builders. I've, I've read the epistles. I've read the epistles of the apostles of, of that's so funny, the epistles of the apostles of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I've read Paul's writings and, and I see these master builders and read what these master builders say. But he says this, and we all need to heed this because we're all building the kingdom of God. Amen? As Christians, we're supposed to be building the kingdom of God, by the way. If anyone builds on this foundation with gold and silver, precious stones, that sounds lovely, but also with wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become evident. It will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Now, what happens to gold and silver and precious stones when you put it in fire? Now, what happens to hay, wood, and straw when you put it in fire? It's burned up. So, how we build on that foundation needs to always be with precious stones, gold, and silver, not with wood, hay, and straw. The fire will test. Did anybody hear what I just said? The fire will test your work. The fire will test the reason you're working for the Lord. And it will prove it to be fake because it will be burned up and burned out or that it's real for it will be enduring and be refined. See, we wonder why God lets us go through the fire. We wonder if we're serving you, God, why does these things happen to us? Why is this happening to me? It's called a refiner's fire, a testing fire. He said if anyone's work, it's going to test our work to tell what sort it is. In other words, if the reason we're doing it is to be like the Pharisees and the religious people of Jesus' day was, is to be praised of men, is to be seen of men, is for people to brag and boast on us. That's wood, hay, and straw. And so there's no reward coming from God to us for that. It's going to be burned up. When we're tested, it's going to be revealed that what we portrayed to be was fake. Wasn't good. Wasn't real. But when we go through the fire, come on, and we keep enduring, and we say, I'm not quitting. I'm not looking back. I'm not going back. Yes, it's been a hard season, but Christ is my firm foundation. Hallelujah. I will not turn away from following God. Then it's tested and it's proven to be the real thing. The works are tested in this side of heaven. Our works, our rewards are coming when we get to heaven. If we get to heaven, our work, our, we're going to be rewarded there. But here's where they're tested. Now is where they're being tested. You and I are being tested to see what manner of work we are building on that chief cornerstone. 
It says, if anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. So people says, well, I work for God and don't expect nothing in return. Let me tell you what. The wages may be low for working for the Lord down here, but the rewards are great in heaven for those who serve the Lord now. Amen? So, if your work endures this testing of fire, you will receive a reward. If anyone's work, though, is burned up, means the heart wasn't right. They were serving the Lord, but not with their heart. The Bible says, do all you do with your heart. Do it. Do it with a, a fervent heart. Do it with purity. Do it with sincerity, not not just to try to get something from somebody. There's people today that the only reason they do anything good for somebody is they're hoping to get something from them. Otherwise, if they didn't think there was nothing in it for them, they wouldn't be doing it anyway. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved. Yet, so through fire. So see, let's go back. If they put the stone, if, if we build our life on the mere fact that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, we will be saved. If our faith is alone in Christ and the cross, we'll be saved. So even if we work, our works, we can lose our rewards, but we'll still be saved if our faith is where it should be in Christ. You say, well, that don't sound fair. It's not fair, maybe, but it's God. He says, you know, I'm not going to reward that kind of work. But because you kept your faith in me and the cross... I will allow you into heaven. But it's going to be embarrassing to get to heaven and lose our rewards or have no rewards because we did not do our work with sincere, pure hearts toward the Lord. I mean, that would be so embarrassing. It would be embarrassing to have no rewards. That's all the scriptures I want to share with you today. Um, my prayer today is that we have grown first and foremost in grace. In believing. Because the key part of faith is believing. And it's believing in the word of God. You say, well, that sounds so simple. It is simple. He made it simple because he wants everybody to go to heaven. It is not God's will to make it hard. God made it easy. Think about, there's, look at the love. He made it so easy for us to be saved. All he said was believe on me. Trust in, rely on, and depend upon me to save you because you cannot save yourself. You cannot save yourself. But if you will put your faith in me and what I did for you at the cross at Calvary, and if you will receive my gift, I give you a gift to go to heaven, to live eternally with me. All you got to do is accept my gift. 
for every man, woman, boy, or girl that says, I receive. I'm not worthy, but I receive. He shall be saved. What a mighty God we serve. How great a love the Father has given unto us that we should be called today the sons of God. Say this with me. I am a son of God. Say, I am a child of of the most high God. Say this with me. My father is God. And Jesus is my Lord and Savior and my brother. I am a child of God. You hold your head high. You face whatever you have to face and you go knowing that you're a child of the Most High God. And Jesus said this, I will, up, upon this rock, come on, can I share this one more verse? Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. I have built my house on that rock. That rock is who? Jesus Christ. Chief cornerstone. And the gates of hell, they may storm you. God will use it as a test to prove that you're the real thing. Amen. We're going to show the devil we're the real thing. Come on, I'm the real thing. I may walk through fire, but I'm going to come through it because Jesus is going to be right there with me in it. Come on, even if a flood comes, he's going to take me through it. Amen. Come on, give him praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. We hope you enjoyed today's message. To see more messages like this one, to support or interact with our outreach ministry, please visit our YouTube or Facebook page, Lighthouse Outreach Ministries. If you're in the area, come and visit us at 9437 West U.S. Highway 84 in Newton, Alabama. See you there.